Tell me when you're ready, Kyle. You ready? Well, yeah, I'm ready for July. I got a, I got a hotel yeah, that night. We do uh, the Axel Ride thing. Oh, she's not too far. Yeah, Good I'm idea. staying at the. Uh, okay, uh, everybody's attention, please. Welcome to the Houston Beekeeper Association. My name is Joe Powers. I'm the current president of the Beekeepers Association. Kyle Wolf up here is our secretary, and uh, Mike Simmons is our vice president. Um, just real quick, some upcoming events. On the 20th of May is World Bee Day. Um, it's somebody started by people in Serbia, and it's I think it's Serbia, and it's like some guy's birthday from way back in the 1700s. So I don't know. They've got it going though. It sounds like it's some stuff online about it. You can watch some videos online and stuff. The 23rd of May, which is next Tuesday, is going to be Harris County Beekeepers Association meeting out in Pasadena. 10th of June is the Houston Natural Beekeeper Association. They meet on uh, Billy Street between two houses in a trailer. I'm not sure. I've never been there. <clears throat> then a uh, big one is on the 17th of June is Texas Beekeeper Association uh, Summer Clinic, and that'll be up in Conroe. And that's a good one to go to. Uh, again, that's like eight hours of beekeeping education in one day. So it's really good to do those if you, could, if you can go. Then our June meeting is on the 20th. And we'll be our topic that that next month will be uh, how to make mead, which is uh, basically a wine you make out of uh, honey. And then on the 18th of July, we're going to have our um, July social, and that'll be at Axelrad uh, Beer Garden, uh, kind of inside the loop there. So uh, the more information that will be coming out. And then finally, on the 9th of September is another all day beekeeping event, which is the Brazos Valley Beekeeper Association Fall Beekeeping School in Bryan. Again, another day where you can get, that's on the 9th of September. And uh, that's a, another day where you can get basically eight hours worth of beekeeping education in one single day, which is pretty good. It's, yeah, all these dates are on the website as well, as well as links for ones that need to be where you have to like sign up or whatever, which I think you have to sign up for the summer clinic and the fall beekeeping school. You got to sign up for those in advance. Or you can probably pay when you get there, but it's probably more. Okay, so our speaker tonight is Mike Simmons. He's going to talk about how to extract honey. Take it away, Mike. All right. Uh, normally, I'd like to have actually real honey with supers here, but unfortunately, none of my honey is capped right yet. I guess this weather has not helped them very much. So um, I'm going to skip around a little bit from last year and do. Uh, first, we'll just talk about the, the tools and equipment you need to extract with. So if you're a member, we have, this is one of the, one of the extractors we have. And if you, you can rent them for free, they're right around the corner off of a uh, Hillcroft and the public storage. You just reserve it on the website and then uh, pick it up. Was it for a weekend? Uh, Friday to Friday. Yeah, Friday, okay, for a week. So Friday to Friday, uh, that's plenty of time to do your extraction. Um, so we have two of these and then we have, is it three, two or three? Two of those, then we have the, the six frame. Yeah, um, some of them are radial and some of them are tangential. So the difference between a, a tangential one, when you put the frame in, you put it sideways and it'll only spin out one side at a time. So after you uncap it, you slide in there and you spin it. And then after it spins out that side, you have to pick it up, flip it around and then spin it again. Uh, a radial, you put this on, that, on the outside, the top of the frame, and then it, it goes around like this. So it's, it spins both sides at the same time. The, the radials, you have to spin a little bit harder to get to get a good extraction, but it's it's way worth the extra effort for not have to flip them. Um, and then you need a so this is the the one that we give that, that comes with the uh, the Houston beekeepers equipment. So you see it's got a uh, like a strainer. I think that's made out of queen excluder in the bottom. So this is a uncapping tank. So when you're when you're on it's got a little nail thing here to help you flip it around so you can uncap it and then all the honey the cappings will fall to the bottom and any honey left in will drain into this next tank and then there's a honey gate on the front for you to drain it with and then they don't fit in here if you get a really fancy commercial one you can set them in here too like that but they're super expensive i don't like these i hate these things so this is what i use at my house um i got this off of amazon there's like six different companies that make one uh, you can get them from all the major bee suppliers. Um, and I use a five gallon, six gallon bucket. 
and I put a, uh, a mesh bag in it. I get these off of uh, Amazon, but they're for beer brewing called Brew in a Bag. It's just a, a mesh. You can get them at Home Depot, too, for paint strainers. But I like the ones. These are smaller, though. They don't go all the way to the bottom of the bucket. So there's actually room for the honey to drain out. If you get the five-gallon bucket ones from Home Depot, they're going to go all the way in the bottom. You'll have to hoist it up and hold it up to drain all the honey out. And then you'll need a strainer. Once you extract it out into the, your extractor, you'll need a, a, a strainer to get all the bee parts and the rest of the honey that's still in it. Um, this just fits on top of your bucket that you're going to drain into like that. And then you just drain into this. And it's got two different, it's got a, it's got a, a coarser basket and then a finer basket. I think these are like 600 microns. So any, uh, what is it? Yeah, something like that. So any, any pollen's still gonna pass through here, but it'll get most of the bee parts out. Customers don't like bee legs for some reason in their honey. Uh, this one just, it says bee smart on the top, but there's a, there's a bunch of different brands. The the one I see every, all the, the suppliers selling now is a little yellow limo bobber, but it, Yeah. Yeah, I've seen some that are, yeah, they're square like this and then they have a, a, a ring for the bucket. Yeah, which this one has one too, but I've had this one forever, so I just keep using it. Huh? Yeah, it just holds it while you're, while you're uncapping it and then it's got enough room in the bottom or I can tear everything up. Yeah, just it, yeah, it all drains down into here, so all the cappings and, and any honey that comes out goes into the bucket. So usually, you know, I usually do like 15 to 20 supers a year, so I might go through two or three of these mesh bags, but I'll end up with a couple gallons of honey in here. Um, and then you'll need uh, uncapping tools. So there's a whole bunch of different ways to do it. This is my favorite one. Uh, this is the one that comes with your if you get the, the beekeeping associations tools. Um, it's super simple to use. Pretend this is capped honey. You just run it along and it'll pull the caps right off. And this, this little blade right here is to keep you from going too deep or too shallow. Um, and then they have these little forks. I like having one of these around while I'm using that because if you end up with some wacky comb that's got like little valleys and stuff in it, you can pick at it or get scrape up the combs like that. Um, they also got this thing, a hot knife. I don't like these. They, they I always burn myself with them and then I'll set it on my plastic table and melt it and then all kinds of, just, some people love them. I mean, if that's what you like, go for it. Uh, we do have these at the, with the association too, if you want one. Yeah, I, I don't like melted beeswax in my honey anyway. Um, a scallop bread knife works really well too. If you have really nice, pretty comb, like if you're doing nine frame supers, so if you, just for everyone, if, if you're gonna do nine frames and you've never done it before, it needs to be drawn comb before you put it in there. So if you put nine frames of undrawn comb, undrawn foundation like this, you're gonna end up with some really wacky comb. You're gonna have to, you're gonna end up doing a lot of crushing and straining. Um, but if you have drawn comb the next year, you can put it in there and just put nine frames and they'll draw it out way past the edge of the frame. And so it makes uh, removing the caps really easy, especially with like one of these, monsters or a bread knife. Um, and then you need some sanitation supplies. So like, if you're like me, you got a beard, you gotta get a beard net. These are always cool. Um, you should wear, when you're extracting honey, you should wear long sleeves. Um, I like wearing closed toed shoes. You ever drop a honey frame on you, it hurts. Um, you should wear pants. Um, a hat or a hairnet, one or the other, if you have hair. I don't have that problem anymore, so. Um, it only takes one customer find, if you're selling your honey, if you takes one customer finding like an arm hair or something in their honey, because you know, a, a mad customer will tell 10 people, but a happy customer only tells like one or two people, so. Um, it, it's, it's good preventative medicine. Um, Oh, if you're going to store honey, for, for, unless you're huge, most people like to store them in five-gallon buckets. Um, 
if you're going to store in a five gallon bucket and you buy a lid, make sure you get one that has a gasket and that has a tear strip around it. Those will fit airtight so you don't get uh, moisture getting into your honey later on and it goes bad or anything. Yeah, I wouldn't, like an Omega lid, I wouldn't use one of those. I have a bunch of those that I store other stuff in. They're not airtight. Yeah, the, the best you're gonna do is is uh, the, the lids. Yeah. So if you wanna get the lid back off, you have to take the tear strip off. You can put it on, you put it on with a hammer. Yeah, you'll have to use, yeah, you have to use like a, a, a dead blow or a rubber mallet to get the, the, the lid on it. But then if you, when you want to take the lid, some of them you can get with a, a, a pour spout in the middle. Like you can get them at Home Depot and they're, they're food grade, so. Uh, that's another thing with your, with your equipment. I know beekeepers are like a lot of DIY stuff. And if you're gonna have anything in contact with honey, it needs to be food grade. Um, you know, like the stand for this, you know, it's got two by four, and that's not food grade. So, but it's not in contact with honey. That's fine if you want to DIY something like that. But if you're going to DIY stuff that's going to be uh, in contact with honey, it should be food grade. Uh, if you buy anything from a uh, from any of the bee suppliers, they they do sanitary welds on all their their stainless steel and stuff. So. There we go. Um, so. One thing I recommend to anybody, especially if you're going to be selling honey, is to take a food handler safety course. They have them online. They're like seven bucks or something like that. And then you, and it's the same course that like a waitress or a line cook will have to take. Um, it has a lot of stuff that, that's not going to apply to you. Like I took the food manufacturer's course and I spent like four hours learning how to store seafood to suck a bottle of honey. But um, the, the food handler safety course is a lot quicker. It's like three or four hour course that you can do online. Um, and if you need to be a waitress or a waiter sometime, you can, you already got it. Um, so you shouldn't cough, cough or sneeze in your hands, smoke cigarettes, scratch your head, touch your face, and any habits that'll contaminate your hands while you're processing honey. Um, what I like to do is wear latex gloves the whole time. I'll keep a box of them on the table. Uh, not only that, it's handy if you get honey all over you, you can just throw it away and then get a new, new pair. Um, it's best if you have a hand washing sink nearby you can wash your hands when you take a break or whatever. Um, um, if you don't, another hack to that is to use uh, unscented baby wipes. You can, I keep a set of those too. They're nice for cleaning up too. Uh, you shouldn't process honey if you're sick. So if you're sick, just wait. It, processing honey, especially if you're doing more than just a couple supers is a lot of hard work. So you're better off waiting anyway. Um, you should be clean. Your nails should be clean. Uh, you shouldn't wear jewelry while, while you're processing honey. Uh, not only for the sanitation part, but I don't know if you ever seen them pictures of somebody where their wedding ring degloves their, their finger. It's just a bone left. You don't want that. Um, those extractors, when you get a ro that rotate mass in there, depending on the size, that's a six frame. So you could probably get 20 pounds or more rotating in there pretty quick. So it'll take your finger off. Um, you should be wearing uh, non-skid shoes. Uh, believe it or not, if you get a puddle of honey, it's pretty slippery on the floor. Uh, wash your hands again. If you take the food handler course, they say wash your hands like 700 times in it. Uh, we talked about hair. Uh, you shouldn't smoke or chew gum. Don't cough or sneeze, you know, normal stuff. Uh, the general area where the, the honey is to be processed should be thoroughly clean before processing. So that's, that's actually an important one. So you really want to clean all your equipment first before you process and then make sure it's bone dry. So honey, if it gets the moisture levels too high, it'll ferment. So you need to make sure your extractor, everything is dry. Um, the best way you can do it is to wash it all with the mild detergent like Dawn or any kind of dish soap. Then you want to uh, rinse it real good and then sanitize it with a 10% chlorine solution. So, um, they actually make like little chlorine test strips you can buy if you really want to get hardcore. Like that's what every kitchen in the city of Houston does when they, with the food they serve you, they sanitize all their stuff before they do it. And then you want to let it air dry. Um, the quick test for it, make sure it's completely dry is, is sniff it. If it smells like chlorine, it's not dry yet. 
Yeah, you're supposed to rinse it, sanitize it with a sanitizer solution or water exceeding 180F. So it's, it's one teaspoon to one gallon of regular bleach to make the sanitizing solution. Um, if you do that, you wanna buy the, the dollar store uh, bleach that doesn't, not the no splash, not the lavender scented, just the plain old. Um, and yeah, I gotta watch out now, they make two different kinds. They make regular bleach and then they make concentrated bleach. Um, so if you can find concentrated bleach without any additives in it, you can use it, but it would be half the amount. The concentrated is 6%, the, the old school stuff is 3% chlorine. Um, so talking about setting up your workspace, so you cannot beat a table like this. Like I, I use a six foot or an, I think it's a six foot or eight foot table when I do honey. Um, so one of the things with honey is it extracts easier if it's warm. So I, what I do is I'll get all, I'll pull all my, my supers off, bring them to my shop to where I extract and I leave them outside. I put a lid on and make sure nothing can get in there. Cause I got somebody in my neighborhood has bees. So if you let it sit for a while, you'll end up covered in bees, but I let it sit outside. So it stays warm. And then I just bring in a super at a time as I'm extracting. I'll set it up on the table and then I'll have my uncapping station. And then I usually just put, my, I got a 20 frame extractor so I can put a lot of frames in it. So I can do two supers of mine at one time. Um, with that one, you can only do six. So you, you might want to have it sitting off to the side over here. And then you want to have somewhere to put the extra four frames, or I guess you could just leave them in the super. But you might want to have a lid underneath the super too to catch all the honey that's going to drip out of it. As you move honey supers, the, the, there's caps that are going to break and you're going to leak. Um, so yeah, a back uh, a, a table's super handy to have. Um, yeah, so set a, up in the natural order. Oh yeah, and then have, it's good to have a couple of empty uh, supers. So when you get done with your frames, after you pull them out of the extractor, you can throw them in there to take them back to the bee yard to let them, the bees clean them up. Um, if you're going to be standing there, for, I have one of these, an anti-fatigue mat. It's, it's, if you're going to be standing there for more than three or four hours extracting honey, if you're doing more than a couple hives, it's, it's worth the money. It's gold. Um, you can cover your floor with uh, newspapers or painter's paper before you start. I do that a lot. I'll just, well, I get lazy, so I just do the area that I'm walking in and right where my uh, extractor is. But when you get done, you just pull that up and throw it in the trash. You don't have to spend an hour mopping. Um, you, it needs to be well lit. Uh, you'll get more honey if you're working in a dim garage with one light bulb in it. You'll end up missing caps and stuff. So you'll get more honey out. Um, if you don't have permanent lighting there, you know, get maybe one of them work stand lights or something. Um, and then, yeah, honey, honey's going to attract bugs. So you're going to get, if you can, the best way to do it is extract indoors. So like I have an air conditioned shop, I do it in. It's great. Um, if you don't have one of those, I've seen some people use those. Uh, you get them at Academy. They're like a screened in tent. So they'll have all their stuff set up in there to keep, because you're going to get not only bees come around the honey, but all kinds of other stuff including the, the not so nice stinging bugs like yellow jackets. Um, okay, so to get your honey off, the, off the, the hives, the first thing you gotta do is get all the bees out of your supers. So there's, there's really, there's like three methods to do that. There's, um, you can smoke them and brush them. So if you just have a couple hives, you may not wanna invest in any extra equipment. So you just, you know, you'll pull a frame out. Well, actually, you know, you open the hive, supers on the top, you smoke them down real good, let them, let them get off the frames for a little bit, and then pull your frames out, brush them off, and set them in another super to bring back to your shop. Um, that, that's pretty labor intensive, and it's going to take you a while, but if you only have two or three hives, it, it's not a bad way to do it. Um, you can use a, a fume board. I hate fume boards. I've tried them like three or four different times. I've tried different brands. I've tried different chemicals. The only one that works really well is this stuff called butyric acid. It smells like throw up. Um, if you're married and your wife's not a beekeeper, she's not going to like it. Or he won't. Or if your husband won't like it either, it's terrible. If you get it on you, you stink. That you might as well throw them clothes away. Yeah. Um, and then the other stuff they they make some natural repellents like Fisher's Bee Quick. It works, but it's way slower. Um, it smells like almonds. It smells great. I use it when I do used to do removals, and the homeowners are, what, what are you spraying up there? It smells great, but it just doesn't work as well. Um, and then you can do the way I do it with a leaf blower. 
So I got a, a little electric powered, it's a Ryobi 18 volt, like hundred mile an hour leaf blower. So I'll smoke them out. I try to, you know, I try not to blow too many of them. I'll smoke them out and then I'll flip the, the super on its side, take my leaf blower and I'll stand a couple feet away and start blowing. And then I'll get closer and for them stubborn ones. And I usually have to blow both sides to get, and it gets, you're still not gonna get them all out. It gets, you know, 99% of them out though. Um, it's quick. I didn't have to buy a lot of stuff. I got that leaf blower for like 30, 40 bucks or something. Um, yeah, you might want to wear a full suit if you do that. <laughs> um, yeah, they're not real fond of it, but you know, if you have to do 10, 15 hives, that's the way to do it for, for me anyway. Um, you can use an air compressor. They don't work as well. I tried it once, like with a pancake air compressor. I, I kept having to wait for it to charge back up. And then if you do it at 90 PSI, it'll kill bees. Um, then once you pull your, your supers off and you take them back to wherever you're gonna extract them, you need to do it within 48 hours. So all your supers still have wax moth in them. They're still attracting wax moths. They've got small hive beetle eggs in them. So if you don't extract them with 48 hours, you need to put them back on a, on a, on a beehive so they can be taken care of. Otherwise they will get nasty. Um, and then make sure you leave enough for the bees. So that's really debatable, you know, depending on if you run single deeps, double deeps. Um, like I run double deeps and I leave the double deeps full. Anything after that's mine. Unless they get stingy, then I'll take stuff out of their deeps and, and feed them back with sugar water. But um, Yeah, any, any honey that they have in their double deeps, I'll leave for them. Yeah, I just take off all the supers. That's all my honey. And then I'll put them back on, let them clean those up, and then pull them back off for, to store them. Um, and then you need to make sure that all your combs are at least 75% capped. Um, if you've ever extracted wet honey, it will ferment and within a couple of days. And it's all you can do after that is make meat out of it. And if you have a gallon, a couple gallons of, that's a lot of meat. Um, there's different ways you can check uh, for moisture. Best way, I've never had a problem with it being, as long as they're 75% capped, I've never had any ferment. Um, they do make a, What's that thing, a refractometer? It's a little, I should have brought one, I got one. It's this thing, you, you, you put a drop of honey on it and then you hold it up and it's got, you look through it and it's got a scale on it and it'll tell you the moisture content. I think it's 18% or below is, is safe. I got a cheap one from China. A lot of times it says 19, 20 and none of it's fermented, so. Yeah, with, especially with our 900% humidity and then never stop raining. Uh, so I talked about food grade stuff already. Um, yeah, beer brewing stores, that's a real good resource if you're looking for food grade stuff. Everything they sell is food grade, like hoses and stuff like that. You want to get crazy. Um, they have all that stuff. Uh, like fire, everybody talks about firehouse subs, bu pickle buckets. Don't get one of those. That's great if you want to paint something, but that you'll never get that pickle smell out of them. Um, you can also, uh, bakeries are a good place to go. A lot of times they'll either give them away or sell them, so they get like, five gallon buckets of icing. And once they're done with it, they got to get rid of it. Um, and then you can get anything you get from a bee supplier, you know, from the bee supply, Texas bee supply, whatever they're calling themselves today, Dayton, uh, Man Lake, any of those people is going to be fine. Um, a bottling bucket is nice to have. So most people are going to bottle with a, uh, with a honey gate like this on their bucket. Um, if you want to invest in a bottling, uh, a specific bottling valve, I bought one a couple of years ago. Uh, it was expensive. It was like 150 bucks. It was the best thing I ever spent money on. That's the coolest thing I ever bought B-wise. I was so happy with that thing. It's a, no, it's a, it's actually a plug valve. So it's a, it's a stainless steel and it goes, I got a stainless steel bucket too that I bought a bottom bucket. And then it's got a handle, real long handle and you push down on it and it pulls the plug up and you can bottle one. It takes like, three seconds to do a one pound bottle. That's the only thing about that thing. When you, when I first got it, I overfilled a few bottles cause it comes out so quick, but it doesn't drip. Um, you're not gonna get honey all over the side of your bottles. Um, so, oh yeah. So if you're gonna bottle a bunch of honey, 
you may look at other places besides like Man Lake and Dayton and all the normal bee suppliers for your bottling needs. Um, like there's one in Houston, uh, there's a glass supplier, I can't remember the name of it. Um, you can get a lot cheaper deals going with non-specific bee stuff sometimes. Um, I, like I, I got, I put sailor plastics on here. That this is, this presentation is from last year. That's where I bought my bottles before and I got them for like 20 cents a piece or something. This year I bought them from Webstaurant store online and they were super duper cheap. They were, they beat, they blew everybody, all the bee suppliers out of the water. Um, and it's the same quality, same BPA free plastic bottles. Only thing I haven't been able to find is muse bottles for a good deal. Anybody got one of those? I'm still paying like 250 a bottle. The glass muse bottles with the corks on them, people love them because they're pretty. Yeah, that might be a good place if you don't have a, a ton of it. I, I mean, it doesn't take a lot to go through two or 300 bottles. So a lot of these, you know, even for a backyard beekeeper, you can still get some of these bulk deals on bottles and stuff. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Um, man, it was only 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, so I'll show you how to set up the, uh, the extractor. I don't use bears. I just use one pound. Uh, I switched to queen line bottles now. It's just personal preference, really. They're all the same. The, the bears you can get in a 12 ounce, 12 ounce, uh, 12 ounce honey weight by weight. So if you wanna, if you wanna sell 12 ounce instead of one pound, you can make a little more money. Small, the, the smaller quantities of honey you sell at a time, you'll make more money on. You just gotta sell more of it. So one, one pound works for me really well. Because I, I get customers ask me all the time if I sell a gallon or something, but I sell out every year. So there's no point in me selling at a discount in bulk. Um, so if you get the extractor from us, it's going to come in two different pieces. So there's the stand and then the extractor itself. And then it has these chain dilemma bobbers. And there's a little nut you take off. Okay. Yeah. If you, if that's one thing we would really like y'all to do if you borrow the equipment is to return it clean and with all the bits and pieces. And if it breaks, just let us know so we can get it fixed. I mean, that's what y'all pay membership dues so we can get it fixed. But if we don't know about it, we might give it to the next person broken. Um, you just put these chains down here and you screw it down with these manual extractors. If you're doing it, it's almost, you don't have to, you can do it by with one person, but having two people helps a lot. Because especially if you get unbalanced in one of these. Balance of that honey gate is on the other side. Oh, yeah. Good point. I wish I could get my wife to help me. So if you decide to buy your own extractor later on, having an electric extractor was the best decision I ever made. Like with, with three or four hives, it's not too bad doing manual extraction, but anything over that, or if you have a good year, you know, if you have four hives and you have a good year, you may end up with 10, 15 supers and doing all that by hand, it's a workout. Yeah. There, so once you get it done and you got your, your honey frames uncapped, you're ready to put them in. This is the radial extractor. Um, this one will not take deeps. It'll take mediums and, and shallows. Uh, we have some that will take deeps, but they're, they're tangential, right? Yeah. Like the one I have, I have a 20 frame extractor, but if I put deeps in it, I can put like four frames in it. So I, I don't know who does deeps. They must not like their back. 
Um, so you just put it in there like that. Um, if you have a, like I have a mix, I'm trying to, oops. I'm trying to go all plastic. I like plastic frames cause I'm lazy. I don't want to put wood ones together. Um, so I'm going all plastic, but I still have a bunch of wood frames. I have like five or 600 of them. Um, so when you're loading these up, if you can get all plastic or all wood together, it's great. If you can, you need to, to offset them. So, you know, if you have a couple of wood frames, put them across from each other. Cause that'll help keep them balanced because the plastic frames are much lighter than the wood ones. Um, and then if you have frames that are, you know, half capped or, you know, half drawn and capped and then the other side's empty or whatever, that hadn't been drawn out, it's just foundation still. You gotta walk, you know, try to gauge the weight of your frames and put them across from each other to keep it as balanced as possible. And if you end up with one that's cockeyed, the best thing you can do is, is uh, just spin it slowly for a while and let it kind of even out. Um, so these ones we have are, I think all except for that tangential extractor have one way bearings in them. So once you start spinning, it's gonna keep spinning and the handle won't keep spinning. Uh, the ones that don't have a one-way bearing, like that tangential, once you start spinning this, get your hand out of the way because this thing will come around and, and break your wrist. Um, and you have to spin these pretty hard to get all the honey out. So, And you have to do it for two to three minutes. So that's about the speed you need to go. That's one thing handy about having another part. Yeah, he puts you to work. <laughs> um, that's one thing nice about having another person too. If this thing starts starts getting ready to launch itself, you have the other person hold it down. Just uh, watch where you put your fingers. If you put your finger, because I mean, it's going to be 20 pounds rotating in there. So if you put your fingers in the gear, your finger's coming off. I mean, they're plastic gears, but I, I bet they'll, they'll smash your finger. Um, and then a five gallon bucket will fit under here really nicely. A six gallon won't fit at all. We figured that out last year. Um, I just leave the honey gate open the whole time I'm extracting. You don't want to puddle in there. If it gets to the bottom, it's going to be really hard to spin. Um, what else? This goes a lot faster without real honey. Oh yeah. 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 So, so I mean, you're gonna get all the caps off. They're gonna be in your bucket or or your uncapping tank. But yeah, there'll still be pieces of capping on it and stuff. And when you put it in there, it's gonna spin off. So then you put your. This is a six gallon bucket, so it doesn't fit under here, but it fits under my extractor. But you'll just put it under there like that, and then get it to get it to go into the strainer. Um, one thing I do too is I have an even coarser strainer that I keep, it's like a little one I got from a kitchen store. And I just put it in there and as that thing gets super full, I'll dump it. And that way I keep going with this one because I don't want to pay the money for a cappings extractor. And I just set that colander out, basically anywhere in the yard, and the bees will dig through it, clean up every bit of honey. And then you've got nice wax that you can wipe out. Yeah, so, yeah, all your cappings, you can... Yeah. Melt the wax, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah, plus they get to recycle it. It's a lot less energy for them. Um, yeah, you should do that with all the cappings in here in your tank too. And then uh, with your supers after they're, they're, you know, after you extract all the frames, you put them back in empty supers, take them back to your bee yard or your backyard or wherever your bees are at. And then if you can get them the further away from the beehive, you, know, you want them near the beehive, like in the same yard, but you don't want them right next to the beehives. They have a hard time finding food that's right next to their hives. So if you can get it, you know, 20, 30 yards away from the hives, they'll find it a lot better and they'll clean it up in a day. And you'll come back. Nectar yeah. I've had them sometimes they don't want to seem to clean up the high nectar flow. E e uh. Yeah, you, you can. Yeah. 
Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll clean supers up. Yeah, so when, like, I'm lazy, so I just stack all my supers up. Mine are in fields, though, so I can stack it a couple hundred yards away. And then if I come back in an hour, those things, there's like millions of bees there cleaning up the. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you got neighbors, they might not like that. Uh, top bar hive? Top bar. Oh, I used to keep top bars. So you, you pull the frame out and then you cut the whole honeycomb off. And you put it in a strainer bag like this, smash it up real good. Yeah, well, that's how I did it. Cause I mean, I only had two top bars. If, if you have a lot of top bars, you're, that's a lot of work. <laughs> top bars are not very uh, commercially friendly. They're fun to keep though. Uh, I kept them for like two years when I first started out. And then I decided Langstroth's were the way to go. Um, but yeah, you just, you just crush it all out and then you got to hang it for like 24 hours. And if you can do it in a garage with the door shut so no other bugs can get in there. And then um, where it's warmer, like in, in July or whatever, it'll, it'll drain out pretty good and you'll have a bag full of cappings. You get a lot more wax that way. Yeah, yeah, so um like I, i'm lazy so i i just pay the extra money and get heavy wax frames yeah i mean all the distributors are going to sell them with, with some wax on there you come check this one out if you want this is a regular wax frame this is a couple years old i think this is a yeah it's a pure coat yeah no this is this this frame is brand new i this has never been in a hive yeah, I use the, this is what I use now. Um, but what you do is just get some melted bees wax and just paint it on here with a paintbrush. Or actually, you can do it the really lazy way like I do. You take a bar of wax and just rub it on there like a cheese grater. They like that too. Yeah, you can use a roll, paint roller. I've seen people do all kinds of stuff. I just keep, because I always, I'm always, my, all my yards are remote. I don't have anything in my backyard. My wife hates bees, so I can't keep them in my backyard. So um, I just keep a couple bars of, of wax in my truck. And then when I need to put a frame in, I just rub it real quick and it gets enough on there and they, they seem to draw it out pretty well. They're in their half, their double deeps. I'm only taking the supers off. So I just leave the, I leave the double deeps sitting there on the, on the I got them on stands. I just take those, I throw them all in the back of my truck, blow as many bees as I can out. And then I leave the lids off on the way home. Hopefully the rest of them come out. <laughs> they usually don't. My shop is not there for the shop. So what I do is I wait till the sunset. Yeah. Extract after sunset. So by that time, the bees and the yellow jackets are all in there. Staying in there thing. I'm working at 9 o'clock. Man, I'd buy an air conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that's a that's a good idea if you do it after after sunset you you, you won't have near as many bugs coming to bother you um i i don't personally some people you so if you want to if you just have one or two supers that you're extracting you can leave them on there all summer as long as you keep that hive pretty well strength up they'll keep that honeycomb nice so you can just set it back on top. Um, I've, I've done that before when I'm feeling really lazy. But usually I, I take them off. I take them back to there. I set them all in a big pile, let them get cleaned up. And then I take them back to my shop. And then I, I use a pair of moths to store them with. You store them stacked in the boxes? Yeah. In, but you're inside your air conditioned shop. No, I store them outside. I ain't got enough room in my shop for that. Now you said something to keep from wax moths. What do you use them so they don't get into the Par paramoth? Paramoth. Yeah, they're. Yeah, it's par par been some or other. So. Yeah, so it's 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 like a plate. You take like a paper plate and you put a couple ounces on for each, each every four supers. You got a stack. So if you're doing a big, so I do big tall stacks. So I'll do four supers and another paper plate. Four supers another paper plate. And then I like to put two ratchet straps on, one this way and then one that way, and ratchet strap real tight because that stuff evaporates. So if it's going to sit there for four or five months until the 
the fall flow. I don't want it all evaporating first. And then when you get ready to use them again, you, you un, unstrap them, take them apart, let them air out for like three or four days. That stuff's not supposed to leave any residue. So once it completely evaporates. It smells like regular mod balls like back steel. It's not. Yeah. It smells like it, but it's a different chemical. If you use regular mod balls and you put your, when you put the super back on your, yeah. Yeah, and you can buy paramoths. You can actually buy the same chemical on Amazon, but they call them paramoth balls. Um, or you can buy the, the actual stuff that's registered for beekeeping on all the bees. All the bee suppliers sell it. You can probably buy a paramoth on Amazon too, the actual name brand stuff. Also, if you don't have a mountain stuff, you can buy um, like plastic. And if you don't want to use any chemicals, there there's another way to do it. It's it's even more pain. Um, you can freeze all your frames for like, I'd freeze them for 48 hours at least. Um, if you can store them in the freezer, that's, that's another option. But if you don't have room for, in a freezer, you can freeze them for 48 hours and then put them in trash bags and then put them, they have to be airtight though, because it don't take much for a, a small hive beetle or a wax moth to get in there and then. Yeah. If, it, if it's really airtight, it has a good seal on it. Yeah. You could, you could freeze them and then put them in there if you don't want to use any chemicals. I just want to say Never experienced having to clean up after wax moths. You never want that. Oh, I had a stack that I put up hair moths in my arm. That, that's one of the reasons I use plastic frames now, too. Because, I mean, I have I have like 60 hives right now, so. You know the, the rub of the wax moths, it can be all the time. They don't. They don't right yeah. Stuff, they won't chew for it. Just lick it. That's how it is. Yeah, I read that article. Yeah. I've heard some people say the plastic frames don't hold up. But maybe it's there's good manufacturing bad. I I've only I bought Pierco and I buy Acorn, whichever one is cheapest. I have a buy box like D. I just bought a couple of deeps. They're 150 something bucks for 52 frames. Um, the only issue I've had with these with the black ones is if you leave them out in the sun, if they're not, if they're drawn, I haven't had an issue, but if you just leave one of these sitting on the side of your, side of your truck like that in the sun, they'll warp. And then if you drop them, they, they will, the edges will break. I've broken a few of them like that. Um, the, the wood ones are probably more mechanically sound, but they're an extra dollar fifty a piece. And when I buy four or 500 a year, that gets expensive. Time is your selection operation. Um, so I, I do mine every year at the same time. If they get a little, they eat some of my stored honey, it doesn't really bother me that much. So I do mine in July, mid July. Um, I want to be sure that the tallow flow is completely over. Um, plus, I usually take vacation in January. So I'm at the river drinking beer. So the bees can wait. Um, I wouldn't, it depends on like the tallow flow here is really weird. So Tallow trees, that's our main nectar flow around here, all over Houston uh, and surrounding areas. But I saw people like four or five weeks ago posting that, oh, the tallow flow started. And I'm like, I went out there and checked the tallow trees. And I was like, no, it hadn't, not here. So just around Houston, there's there's a four or five week difference. What, what about if you wait until after the fall? So it's not a bad thing. So. For me personally, I don't, I'm in, that's hunting season. So I'm not extract, I'm not doing, I'm not a beekeeper during hunting season, but, um, the, uh, goldenrod is, is the major nectar source in the fall. To me, it tastes like feet. I don't want, I don't want that stuff with my spring honey. And then the other thing is I let the bees have that. So, you know, they have real honey to eat over the winter time instead of me having to feed them a bunch of sugar water, sugar, when you have 50 high sugar gets really expensive. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
So the the wax moths will eat the edges of wood frames. Yeah, they'll bore. Yeah, actually, sometimes they'll they'll burrow straight through it. And you'll have a hole through your your wooden frame. They don't ever do nothing with these. So if you have, so I have 50, 60 hives. You know, like I said, I'm I, I stopped being a beekeeper during hunting season. So when I come back, there's always a few dead outs, and the wax moths have gotten them. So with these, I can just scrape them down. I usually I scrape them down and then I pressure wash them because they get the you know, wax moths are nasty. Um, and but then I can reuse them. The the wood ones, if you do that once or twice, then they're they go to the junk pile. I mean, as long as you got it cold enough, yeah. That sounds like Yeah, I'd, I'd just be afraid that the tote would blow up. Yeah. Well, you put dry ice in some, it, it turns into CO2. So, but it expands when it does that. So you're going to end up because you're going from a solid to a gas. So. Oh yeah, you can take your all your equipment out to your B yard. I have a 20 frame extractor. I'm not hauling that out to my B yard, but this one's not too bad. I mean, I can pick it up with the stand on. So you can take this out to your B yard or wherever your bees are, let it sit for, they'll clean most of the inside up too. Um, they'll clean this thing up, whatever you got, they'll, all the equipment, they'll, they'll lick all the honey off of it and get it pretty, pretty clean. Uh, you still need to rinse it off and dry it before you return it back to us, but they'll get the majority of it off. Um, yeah, my 20 frame, I just roll out to the front yard and I hose it off. But that thing weighs like 200 pounds. Any other questions? Doesn't have to be about extraction. I mean, I would contact the the either the 4-H people or the FFA people. I've done that with, like, I live in Barbers Hill in Mont Bellevue, and I've their FFA already has a beekeeper that works with them, so they have a they have their FFA area where they keep their donkeys and stuff, and their their cows and chickens and stuff. And they have in the corner they have some beehives that are away from everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I think all the schools have an FFA area too, yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah, cheesecloth works. Uh, you might want to do two or three layers. I like the mesh bags because when I'm done with them, I can throw them in the washing machine. You know, with no soap or anything, just wash them in hot water, and they're they're brand new again, so they're reusable. I think they're made out of nylon. Yeah. 
Yeah, so if you go to our website, the Houston, HoustonBeekeepers.org, you can, there's a, a removal form. Yeah. <laughs> yeah be bees are attracted to lice just like any other bug and then uh Yeah, yeah, if there's enough light from a porch light or something, they'll come to it. Yeah. Yeah, like if, if you if you ever do removals, I used to do removals. So you get a lot of people calling, they're like, they're coming through the light fixture in my house. Because they'll be in a, in between, like usually a lot of times, second story floor, they'll be in between the floors. And the, they'll be in there, the hive will be in there. But then they'll see that light from that light fixture coming through the, the holes in it. And they'll go over there in the light fixture and then come out the light fixture into that people's house. And then this time of year, you're, you're probably getting bothered by them now. This is the, the when the hives are the biggest all year long in Houston. I, I used to do like four or five owl box removals every year. Yeah, they're like the perfect size for bees. Yeah. Matter of fact, I still have one at one of my yards that the bees are still in. I just, they're really mean bees, so I haven't motivated myself to get them out of it. Yeah, most of the bees in Houston, the wild ones or feral bees, are, are they're from commercial stock, so they're usually pretty nice. Uh, there are some mean ones, though. For some reason, Pasadena has the worst ones. You want to do the door prizes? I don't have nothing else to talk about. Unless y'all got some more questions. More questions? Here, wait, wait. We've had a request. <laughs> Mike, do you use a queen excluder for yes, your Yes, I use queen excluders. I'm, I'm lazy. I don't want to deal with. So if you can get a honey band up at the top of your hive, you can go without a queen excluder usually. Um, there's also been a lot of people done some research lately. Uh, I think a couple of months ago, we had Kyle here from the Bee Supply. He did a research project where they, they so everybody says the queen excluders are honey excluders. So they did a study where they, they drilled like one inch holes in the, the honey supers and that that kept the, the, the queen from laying in the honey supers and then they didn't lose any production, honey production. So that's what I do now. So I just, I, most of my, my supers have holes in them and they go in and out. These are our, pri did I get the right prizes? Yeah. Did you recoup that with the yeah, there's the 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 hive body. I just drill one one inch hole in the in the side in the I do it in the front. Okay. And I just do one hole. It works for them. And you're not putting queen excluder in. No, I use a queen excluder. Still yeah. Yeah. So that way they'll build a comb out. The forgers have a shortcut to get in. Yeah, so they, they don't actually have to go through the queen. Through there's the queen still going to be a bunch to go through the queen excluder, but they don't have to. They can go around and go through. There. Another option, you gotta be careful with them. Is they're called emery shims. Uh, they're made by a guy. He's kind of a famous beekeeper, Mr. Emery. Uh, it's I M R I, I believe, and it's a shim that you put between the the the, your, the top of your hive body or on top of your queen excluder, and it has a little notched out section. And it's a three quarter inch shim, and that way they can use it. The only thing with that is you can get a lot of uh, burr comb underneath it. And then if you're going to buy queen excluders, I recommend buying the metal ones. The plastic ones are usually only last. They're like, 
I mean, if you're broke and you need a bunch of them, the plastic ones are cheap, but they're uh, they're only going to last two or three seasons at the most. The the metal ones, as long as you don't treat them, you got to be careful with the metal ones because you bend one little bar, then they're toast. But if, if you take care of the metal ones, they'll last 10, 15, 20 years. You couldn't. I've got a question online. Someone asking, when does the swarm threat usually end? Um, December? Yeah. So those, so Oct you're going to have I everyone. Think October's probably more. Yeah, so any anywhere around Houston, you're gonna have people that feed. I feed all my bees all summer long because I'm doing splits still during summer. So I get queens in the summertime, super cheap, and then I, I do splits. So I'm feeding them all summer. So I have swarm problems in the, in August sometimes. And you got backyard beekeepers that are doing the same thing, feeding their bees. So there, there's really no end of the swarm season. Prime swarm season starts like early March into February and goes to middle of June, July, and then it starts up again in fall when goldenrod starts blooming. So you end up uh, like mid-September to November. Anytime the bees think there's enough yeah. resources for them out there that they can make a new hive, they, they'll swarm. And they get pollen from February till November. So there's always pollen around. So it's really just nectar flow. Once they get nectar flow, they're, they're ready to swarm. That, that's... No. Why, why would rot? Why? They always rot in the corners. That's that's just because of where the finger joints are. You have a uh, on those finger joints, the, the ends of them, you have end grain, which is always more prone to rot than edge grain. Did I say that right? Yeah. No, I've been using queen excluders for, I mean, usually after I get anywhere from five to 10 years out of a, a box. So if, Did you, was it painted? Yeah. Did you paint it or did you buy it painted? When you bought it? Yeah. So they probably didn't paint it very well. I, I, I bought some painted uh, super, uh, deeps before and I wasn't really impressed with them. because did, did it rot like underneath the paint? Like the paint was like made like a little film over it and it was rotted underneath. So it was probably already rot, started to rot before they even sold it to you. Is cedar boxes worth the extra ball? So I, I used to run, I used to buy nothing but cedar bottom boards because they would last forever. I still have some that are like 15 years old and they're still fine. I have some that aren't, I hadn't painted ever. Cause I got for a while there, I was doing removal so much that I didn't have time to paint the equipment. I was just throwing it out there. So I have unpainted cedar bottom boards that are like 10 years old. I can't, if y'all know where to buy cedar bottom boards that aren't super expensive, let me know. Cause I used to buy them from Western B and they quit selling them. Oh. Yeah, uh, I ain't got time for woodwork. <laughs> I wish I did. Question back there. Well, first time you were back here at Meat Keeper, installed my new uh, two weeks ago, and I'm, I'm trying to worry about them getting the outside, the outside thing when they eat. And like you said, they do their painting and their wax on the first job and burn them. Where do I get that? Oh, um, it's from, usually from another beekeeper would be the best thing to do. Tech, Texas Bee Supply sells it. Yeah, yeah, you can get it from the B. It's called the B Supply now, but Texas B Supply. I think they, they they do free shipping after like 100 bucks or something. Yeah. Yeah, you could probably. Yeah, you can buy on you can buy beeswax on Amazon too, but it's probably Chinese beeswax. So if you're worried about, I don't think there's nothing wrong with it, but if you're worried about chemicals, you might not want to buy that. What do you do to get bees to do all frame? Do you? Move your frames. So once they get like eight frames drawn out and those, they won't want to draw them last two out, I take those last two and I move them in. I split their brood nest. They hate that, so they draw it out. And then I push them the honey frames that were on the outside to all the way to the outside. No. Well, so like I have nukes in my yard right now. I have like 20 nukes in my yard. So I'm feeding those, but my, the ones I'm using for honey production, they're not getting fed. Yeah, after honey flows over, I'm gonna split all them hives. So I'm gonna have, I'm gonna go, well, I'm hoping I'm gonna sell some nukes, but I'll have like 40 more nukes and I'll feed all those all summer long and hopefully split them again before the end of the summer. So I'm, 
I'm trying to do the Michael Palmer sustainable apiary. I don't know if you, you've ever, he did a really good talk on the, the national honey show. It's a thing they have in the UK. He's, he's from America. He's from up North though, but he has a really good thing. He does called the sustainable apiary. He has a lot of really good. I don't do all of it, but there's some good ideas I stole from him. He's kind of a famous beekeeper, Mr. Palmer. How many years you consider acceptable use of a comb, recomb, the form comb before you throw it away because of pesticide accumulation? I usually, uh, you're talking about for honey? Yeah. So for honey, eh, three or four years, I rotate my, I don't, rot, I don't, so I do something different with mine. I split them, I use them for splits to make medium splits. And then, then I'll get rid of them. But for honey, yeah, I want to keep it really clean. Three, four years. Is yeah. Max. And then for frames in my hive, maybe five years at the most. One th good thing about selling nooks is you can get rid of your frames at two or three years old. And if you, if you don't want to get rid of them, if you use plastic foundation, you just scrape them down and then melt all that wax and make candles or something. What they do, they, they, because they go out in the fields or around your house and collect their pollen and nectar, people are spraying, everybody's spraying all sorts of stuff on everything. And they track some of that back into the hive and it, just, it, uh, it kind of builds up in the wax over time. So also the other thing that happens is over time, the cells get smaller and smaller. So eventually you might notice if you've got a, a beehive with newer comb in it versus one that's had the comb in there for a long time, you'll, you can see a difference in the size of the bees in the two hives. Yeah. Cause they leave the cocoon in the cell when they hatch. So after you get, you know, 700 cocoons stuck in there, the cell actually shrinks. Eventually I did, a, a, I had a, someone there, his wife died and he had these bees in his backyard for like six years and he called me to come get them. I went and picked them up and then half the, the frames in the brood, they had just sealed them off because they were just not usable for the bees anymore. Now I was on perma, per, what is that stuff called? Perma something foundation. They, don't even, they ain't sold that stuff in like 10 oh, years. Yeah. <laughs> All right, trying to do your random number generator. Yeah, how many of them are there? It's 33. Uh, four. Four. John Swanson, I think, a guest. You won. That's two. You did? You need to actually join. <laughs> that way you won't win anymore. Save us some money. Sure, going to come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with these three, we have a smoker, a hive tool, and uh, some bee food. That's uh, ultra bee. Ultra bee protein food for the bees. Yes, yeah, pollen substitute. It's actually pretty good pollen substitute. That's what I use. So it's not. It's pollen not. is definitely better for them. Real pollen's actually. No, pollen stuff's too super expensive, actually. Um, but when you split a brand new nuke and you don't give them a pollen frame, so I split enough where I can't have, I can't give all my splits a frame of pollen. So I yeah I have to feed that to them until until they can collect enough pollen on their own. Um, so I, I don't really feed that much. So I got a fifty pound bag I've had for like two years now. Probably need to throw the rest of it out. It's probably expired or something. But um, and it, it it's not really a pollen substitute. It's a pollen supplement. So if you try to have they've tried to raise bees on that with nothing but that and they die. Uh, Twenty nine. Twenty nine. Hank. Another hive tool or another smoker? Yeah, oh yeah, the, the, the prizes this week came from Dayton and Man Lake. Or Dadant or Dadent or Dadant or however you say it. I tried to Google that, how to pronounce it, nobody knows. They don't even know. Uh, and then 33. 33. Uh, Susan Yates. You win a smoker. Uh, 
All right. Um, we'll have T-shirts over there if anybody's interested in them. The the softball or baseball looking ones, three quarter sleeve ones are twenty five, and the other other uh, polyester ones are twenty. Twenty. Yep. Do Venmo, PayPal, Cash App. I think that's it, huh? No, I don't know. That's all I got. All right. I was just gonna say real quick. Uh, my friend dreams about me for years. Having Oh, you know somebody to hand that owl box down to. Yeah, you willing to drive to Baytown? <laughs> Give me your number, man. I got I got a lot of work here in, in about July. Yeah, I know. Lazy was the theme of your. Of your of your... I mean, I. I, that's one thing I've learned about, like, I wasn't lazy when I first started. I started with top bars. That's the hardest way to keep bees. But once you get over a certain, the more numbers you get, you're like, I, I, it's a lot, it's a lot of work, right? yeah. So like, you know, most hobby beekeepers, they inspect their bees every 10, 14 days and they go out there and they pull all the frames. And they look at all them. Oh, there's the queen. I haven't seen a queen and I can't, if I, if I see a queen, it's because I'm trying to kill her because I want to replace her. Cause I don't like, it's got eggs. Let's go to the next one. One of the best videos I saw online was got it. Yeah, that never happens to the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the book, I mean, I can find a queen pretty good. So, like, I used to do removals, and you have to find the queen or you. You end up coming back twelve different times to try to remove the bees. So, huh? Yeah. If you, well, I got lazy of that too. I start vacuuming them all, and then if they all go to the vacuum, she's in there. <laughs> now that's it. If we, if uh, anybody wants to stay around, talk about your new beehives or getting one installed, I'll be up here talk to the mentees, mentors, all that. So. Thank you all for coming. I yeah, appreciate it. Thank you, Mike.